I have been extremely critical of Games Workshop, but for a nice change of pace I'd like to discuss something that they do absolutely brilliantly, and that thing is mod support. Now, obviously modding is an extremely important thing to me, it is the origin of this channel and its namesake, so there is no possible way that I can be considered an unbiased source, but I'll still try my damnedest to remain objective in my points. Now, it might seem a bit odd to some of you to reference Games Workshop at this when they aren't the ones doing development themselves, but I have absolutely zero doubt that there is some incentive or directive from Games Workshop to the partner companies regarding modding. It is simply too common amongst these games to be coincidental. If we look at the top 5 most popular Games Workshop releases, three of them have explicit mod support, with a fourth having indirect mod support. I don't need to tell you that 80% of new games are not shipping with built-in mod support these days. Anyways, in this video we will discuss why mod support is such a good idea from the perspective of the gaming industry at large, then we'll focus in on the companies that work with Games Workshop specifically, before looking at Games Workshop themselves, and then we'll close with a hidden downside to all of this, so if that interests you, pour yourself a nice big old glass of milk, get cozy, and let's get right into this. Wow. Before we get started in earnest, I need to clarify some things that many people consider to be a positive for modding that really make no difference on their own. First up, you will extremely frequently hear of people saying that modding increases the lifespan of a game, but that statement means nothing without there being a content trail to take advantage of it. If we look at the game that is most commonly referenced for this statement, Skyrim, we'll quickly realize that a long life doesn't really benefit Bethesda at all. Whether someone plays their $60 game for a week or a decade, Bethesda ultimately sees the same amount of revenue from that sale. Now that being said, there is an indirect revenue benefit from this that we'll discuss shortly. Moving over to the second irrelevant positive though is player options or player enjoyment. Now that might sound like a ludicrous statement to make, especially from an entertainment company, but again, player satisfaction doesn't make money on its own. Those with a great reputation might be able to leverage that for future titles or for paid content, but it is exceedingly rare for mod support to be such a make or break issue at launch that it'll have a notable impact on the game's own sales. What is important to us players only matters if it has a financial benefit for the companies, remember. Lastly, a lot of people think that mod support automatically leads to increased sales, thinking only of the high profile games where that has happened. The reality is, most games with mod support have virtually no uptick in sales, nor a particularly active modding scene. You need sales in order to get enough modders onto your scene to make modding viable. So the order isn't add mod support, see increased sales, see a large mod scene. The order is see increased sales, add mod support, see a large mod scene. I have a number of games in my library with abject mod support that have only a couple dozen mods or less owing to a small player base. Conversely, I have games that shipped without mod support at all that have dozens of mods or more thanks to having a player count that exists in the millions. Alright, so we went over the false positives to begin with, but let's move on to the actual positives for the game companies here, and let's start with an easy one. It can make the player base more likely to purchase your titles, especially if you've developed a reputation for it. Skyrim sold more than Oblivion, which sold more than Morrowind, which sold more than Daggerfall, as the community had come to expect top tier modding support from the company. Given the sheer number of sales on Steam, it's easy to see that Bethesda is definitely making a healthy bump in sales relative to the console market, primarily down to mod support on the PC space. But another good reason to do mod support is to increase the sales of paid content. Not only do mods help keep the player base invested in your game between DLCs, which if we're looking at a game like Total Horhammer, which we'll discuss later, can be a huge thing, they can also force players into buying DLCs in order to access some of the modding scene, which further promotes your DLC sales. For an anecdotal example of this, I couldn't stand Vanilla Fallout 4. I thought it was a tremendous step down from what New Vegas had accomplished. But down the road, I still ended up buying all of its core DLCs, as the modding scene eventually began to expect ownership of that content, leaving me with the choice of either being cut off from the modding scene, or investing further into a game that I didn't necessarily want to. And Fallout is not alone in that regard. Modders frequently adapt to new DLC releases and use the content within for their own mods, increasing the need for others to now own that same DLC. But as was alluded to earlier, mods do a great job of keeping your player base invested in between DLC releases. As was mentioned earlier, Total Warhammer 2 makes an extremely great example of this. We are now up to a 7 month window in between DLC releases. That's a long time to leave your player base just dwindling and hoping that they are still invested into your game. However, thanks to the modding scene keeping them going, 
you now have a fairly active and refreshed player base so that when you do release a DLC, it's to a game that people are still actively playing as opposed to hoping that they'll come back to your game. But Games Workshop partners have some additional benefits over and above standard companies when it comes to modding, and that primarily boils down to their unique relationship with Games Workshop. Whereas games like Skyrim, XCOM, and Halo have an anything-goes attitude towards mods, the reality is modding actually requires a fair amount of moderation. Stolen assets, adult content, IP violations, and more can take up a considerable amount of time and energy for a company to have to monitor, especially if Steam's Workshop is to be used as the host. Games in the Warhammer universe tend to skip right over those issues, as modders aren't needing to pull from other game franchises, nor are most people clamoring for a Skaven nude mod. In those rare instances where moderation does become necessary, companies can also very easily pass the blame over to Games Workshop. If 2K steps in to shut down a modding project, you can rest assured that the modding community is going to take note of that transgression, and they are going to hold 2K exclusively responsible for it. But Games Workshop has a very publicly listed set of rules when it comes to modding, featuring stipulations such as no cross-contaminating of their own IPs, no denigrating the Warhammer IP, and my personal favorite, no copying from other IPs in the Warhammer world. That last option is reserved exclusively for Games Workshop to use in an official capacity, apparently. Those lists, however, mean that in the case of a DMCA takedown, it's almost assuredly not going to be the developer or publisher who takes the bad press. It'll be Games Workshop themselves. As an addition to that last point, Games Workshop's iron grip on the modding scene tends to provide a security blanket of sorts to developers. Competition gets shut down while official releases get promoted, meaning the official games aren't quite so pressured by the modding scene from other games. Lastly, as was mentioned earlier, there is very clearly some sort of behind-the-scenes incentive for partner developers to implement mod support from Games Workshop, as the sheer number of them that support it is far, far above the industry average. While one could make the tenuous connection that modifying your dudes and modifying a game about your dudes seems logical, there are incredibly few studios that exist as an exclusive partner to Games Workshop. In fact, I actually can't think of a single one myself in the modern era. So the likelihood on that being the reason why we get so much mod support seems incredibly small to me. I would hazard a guess that there's a financial incentive offered from Games Workshop to implement it, although it isn't mandatory. But as much as players and partner developers win in such an exchange, there is another party who wins more so than all of them in this exchange, and that's Games Workshop themselves. In case you were wondering why they would ever offer a financial incentive for mod support, I actually think it makes a lot of fiscal sense for them. First and foremost, remember, Games Workshop's relationship to video games is in taking a cut of sales in exchange for using its IP. The more revenue the developers and publishers make, the more money Games Workshop makes. So all those previous points about increased revenues still hold true for Games Workshop as well in this exchange. But their ability to manage the situation goes far beyond that scope. Owing to their rather voracious legal team, Games Workshop is able to manipulate the modding scene not just of its own games, but of other games as well when the situation calls for it. When other mods and other games don't affect their own releases, Games Workshop is content to let them exist and carry on their merry way. For example, there is the Warhammer 40k mod in XCOM 2 that was released several years before Daemon Gate was even announced, meaning Games Workshop had no reason to really go after it. In theory, it's actually offering a little bit of free advertising for them at that point in time. But when mods directly butt up against their own releases, Games Workshop can and will hit them with the DMCA. Folks who were following the Battlefleet Gothic mod for Sins of a Solar Empire were likely a little confused when it simply shut down after months and months of consistent, rapid progress. They were likely a little less surprised when it was announced that there would be an official Battlefleet Gothic game coming soon after. And while this next bit is a little bit speculative, were I a Games Workshop partner developer, I would also be keeping my eye on the mod scene to try and see what modders have done in order to gauge what fans are interested in purchasing. It's effectively a crude market analytics tool at that point. I would also imagine that there is a small but noteworthy bump in their miniature and literature sales as well from mods. Games Workshop's IPs are vast, and a lot of the smaller details tend to get missed in official releases. It has to, just owing to the sheer scale of it all. But for hardcore fans, like the kind of fans who don't think twice about dedicating weeks or even months of their own time in exchange for a free mod, those details tend to be front and center. Sharing that lore with more casual fans is a great way to get those casual fans interested in buying things beyond the generic Space Marines. Now, given that Games Workshop's finances are overwhelmingly tied to miniature sales, this likely does help prop up their core business model. Speaking of that lore, I think that that's something that's fairly unique to Games Workshop's position, and frankly the main reason that the strategy works at all for them in the first place. Imagine if Bethesda didn't allow other IPs in its own mod scene. 
that would kill their game series faster than the amount of time it takes to experience your first bug in them. Few IPs have the pure scale of lore necessary to close the borders to the mod scene and still have it function, and I think that that's truly the hidden strength that Games Workshop has in all of this. Not only do they still get all the other benefits from the modding scenes, they can also steer it back to themselves time after time, and most amazingly of all, no one seems to mind. But I promised you a hidden downside to all this, and it's a somewhat niche one, but one that I expect will become less and less niche as time goes on, and that's access to the game files, very specifically the 3D models. Now, in case you're scratching your head, let me explain. In order to allow for mod support, modders obviously need to be able to access the files themselves in order to modify them. Okay, so what? That doesn't mean anything. Well, it kinda does, uniquely in Games Workshop's case. I recently made a new kill team for playing, well, kill team, with my friends. But rather than rushing out to spend money on Games Workshop options, I instead decided, hey, there's some pretty neat options already available in my games and mods, why not use those instead? So that's exactly what I did. I went through some of my games and made myself a lovely little Necron kill team, posed them how I like, and then printed them. And while this is likely uncommon these days, especially given the lack of market penetration by 3D printers, I expect that will change going forward, again as 3D printing grows in popularity. And there's not really anything Games Workshop can do to stop that outside of locking down their games and hiding access to the models within, which in turn would kill off their own modding scene. Bear in mind, this is not the only avenue of attack 3D printers unlock against Games Workshop, but it's just one more arrow in the quiver, and one which exists predominantly through Games Workshop's own policies. I will be discussing those same threats in the next video, so if you're a scurvy dog, well, stay tuned for that one. Anyways though, that wraps it up for this one. So tell me, is there something else you like about Games Workshop? Does the mod support not matter to you in any capacity? Did I miss something obvious in my video? Let me know down below, you know I always enjoy chatting with you lovely people. But anyways, I want to thank you so much for spending time with me, and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye!